The Modern Acre, agriculture for the next generation farm and business. The Modern Acre is a community of students, farmers, professionals, and entrepreneurs passionate about building their ag businesses through modern day innovation and technology. If you're in the ag industry and looking for strategies for your business and inspiration from industry leaders and disruptors, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join the community of ag innovators at themodernacre.co. Hey guys, you're listening to episode 68 of The Modern Acre. Ooh, the big 6-8. We're just moving right along, aren't we, Ty? We sure are, and we have a great episode for you guys today, um, covering some topics that are really interesting and near and dear to Tim and my heart, my hearts. Um, one is regenerative agriculture, uh, which we haven't talked about on the podcast yet, but we've definitely been uh, learning more and more about um, and just interested in the topic of soil health. Um, and second is um, building an online community. Yeah, I mean, it's we're definitely hitting uh, hitting some good topics today. Soil is is sexy again. I feel like there's a lot of buzz around soil health lately. So much buzz. Um, you can just like, if you just included soil and blockchain in the same sentence, I think, um, you know, someone would spontaneously combust. I think so. So this week we talked to Sarah Harper, who's the CEO and founder of Grounded Growth. Sarah's doing some really cool things in the regenerative agriculture space, um, creating a community with growers and small food companies and basically connecting the two parties. So it's growers that that want to get rewarded for the practices that they're doing and small companies that actually value that and are willing to pay a premium. So it's really cool to see her connect those dots. Yeah, and I think she's doing it in a really, really innovative way. She's, you know, connecting those dots, but she's doing it through this online community where she has educational videos. So she's training farmers about how to change their practices and she's connecting all these different interested parties. So I think her approach is a good one. She has extensive experience on Capitol Hill um, on some of these topics. So just a wealth of knowledge. Um, and there's a ton in here about regenerative, about building online communities that you guys are not going to want to miss. Let's get into it. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the show. Good to have you here. Hi, great to be here. Yeah, we're super excited to talk to you and learn more about ground, Grounded Growth, but maybe just tell us who you are and what you're up to right now. Yes, yeah, so I'm Sarah Harper, and I'm the founder of Grounded Growth. And right now, I am up to really trying to grow our members-only uh, online community, um, particularly trying to add in more food companies to become partners with our regenerative farmers. Yeah, I think regenerative agriculture is a really interesting topic. We haven't uh, discussed it much on the podcast uh, yet, so we're really excited to dig into it with you. Maybe let's start by uh, you sharing a little bit more about your background, where you grew up, and uh, your early career. Yeah, so I grew up in a very small town, Beloit, Kansas, um, about 4,000 people, wheat fields all around. Um, both my grandparents farmed, uh, but both my parents did not. And uh, I grew up around agriculture, aware of it, um, but also aware of how hard it was. And in particular, um, my mom's side of the family had you know, a real push from my grandmother to, to all of her siblings to get off the farm because it was, it was hard. It was, um, it was, you know, they had hoped that their, that their kids would go to college and, and, uh, be able to find an easier life. So I saw that side of it. I, I, uh, as I said, was aware of it, but didn't plan on working in it. Didn't think it would have any, any connection, you know, to me, but, um, I always loved speech and debate. I love politics. I love history. And as you can imagine, that didn't make me maybe the most popular kid in, <laughs> in Beloit, Kansas. Uh, but that was okay. Um, so I went off to, uh, to K-State and uh, joined the speech and debate team, which was a big door opener for me. And it got to go all around the country and debating politics and uh, writing persuasive speeches and, you know, nerdy fun things like that <laughs> every weekend. Uh, but it, eventually after that, went to Washington, D.C., uh, wanted to work on Capitol Hill and, and got that chance. And the, uh, the, the issues that I got to work on, the ones that, um, that ended up being the door that opened for me was to work on agriculture, environment, and energy. So kind of back to, back to my roots. And that's really what led me to work on agriculture from a policy 
beginning. That's really cool background. I think a, a similar story of a lot of farm kids that kind of grow up and they're it's a it's a hard life and the parents want the kids to go away to college and get educated and and oftentimes get away from the farm. But it's cool to see you kind of trend back in the in that direction and get involved in in politics in D.C. So maybe kind of talk us through kind of those early years in Washington, D.C. What kind of policies did you work on? Yeah, um, quite a few things. Of course, the farm bill always uh, <laughs> is always there in the background. Uh, but I worked for a member that was not on the uh, ag committee. And so that wasn't the core work that we were we were doing. And I was tasked with trying to find a pro environment uh, and pro agriculture uh, legislative piece, which um, I, I was working at that time for, for my home state of Kansas, and and not an easy, <laughs> not an easy square to circle. Um, but so I, I did a lot of research, reached out to a lot of environmental groups and uh, farm groups, of course, and and found uh, what is still kind of running through what I do today, which was at the time called uh, agricultural offsets or soil carbon sequestration. Um, And a lot of that is is at the core of regenerative agriculture now, soil health and restoring soil to its its healthiest state. Um, But so at the time I worked on a couple pieces of legislation to, which would have rewarded farmers, created a conservation program that if they did certain practices like no-till or um, cover crops, rotational, uh, rotational changes, that uh, if they would allow NRCS to measure the soil carbon changes from those practices, that they would get a conservation payment. So we would have known, I mean, think how great this would have been if my little bill had <laughs> passed. Um, we would have known what, what soil types stored carbon based on which practices and, and where they were. Um, but it was uh, kind of attacked from all sides, and it was it was an important several important lessons for me, both in the substance of which practices you know did things like storing carbon and how they did those things. I learned a lot from soil scientists and agronomists, um, but then also um, on the environmental side, the linkage to the climate change issue and um, you know just the the different alliances and. Uh, strange bedfellows that that could occur, and then of course the interesting attacks from the side you didn't expect. So learned a lot um, from that issue, um, and kind of carried on through to to today. As I said, um, and I know we'll talk more about when we launched launched Ground and Growth, but but that was I saw a market opportunity kind of die right in front of me with the climate bill when it died. Uh, because I was working on an offset title that would have, you know, linked to that. And so I thought that that opportunity had gone. And so when I, I started to see, you know, signs of life again around a market or a, a reward for how farmers grew and not just what they grew, that was what was really exciting and big impetus for me to to jump back in. Okay, this is all just super interesting to me. I, I love the the background in the the bill you proposed, and I think all the lessons um, you obviously took away from it. And I think it's a interesting dynamic with the public and private sector, and you kind of t- going from from public into private. So maybe talk about uh, that transition and the idea uh, for grounded growth. Yeah. So after I worked on the Hill, um, well, during that time in, in the process of drafting the bills, I had a chance to work, as I mentioned, with a number of environmental groups. And one in particular really impressed me, Environmental Defense Fund, uh, both because they were willing to work with somebody from a very conservative <laughs> office um, and because they uh, they really did follow their tagline. They were always interested in finding the ways that worked and solution focus rather than uh, problem propagation. So, um, I ended up going to work for them shortly after, um, that time and, and did outreach back to Capitol Hill on the ag offset bill and on the climate bill and, and particularly reaching out to build alliances with farmers and, uh, and then other Republicans, um, and played a big role in kind of translating each side to the other, because as I would tell both of them, you know, you can each say, you should describe a large farm. And if one of you describes it as a factory farm, then the other has stopped listening. So, you know, you can, you can use that term, uh, 
what, 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 what is it you want to achieve? Do you want to go into this office and feel good about yourself? Or do you want to try to, to find a way to work with them? And there are clearly groups that are in both camps. So, um, I did a lot of that, that work. And then, uh, ultimately went into consulting and worked with both farm groups and, uh, businesses, uh, on sustainability it shifted from not just climate to the broader issue of sustainability. And in particular, this was around the time when, um, large companies like Walmart were starting to set their own standards. And, and so it became a big interest, obviously for everybody that sells into to that venue to understand that and start setting their own policies to gather that data. So I got really into helping companies do that and gave me a great window into the, the large company sustainability side. Um, and then shifted into, uh, I went to work for a, a smaller company focused on marketing and really got to, to start dive, diving deep into small uh, emerging food companies. And that's where I've really been focused the last three years now, um, both while I was there and then and then out on my own. Um, and I just fell in love with that 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 sector, kind of ha- as I've always had a love for farming, because th- they're very similar. And I tell each of them that I mean that that role again of explaining each explaining them to each other, translating, kind of building bridges. And uh, they, this emerging food company in the natural food space, that's this, this area I've focused on, um, they're very much like farmers. They're independent, they're passionate, almost to a fault, <laughs> often, often in ways that hurt their, maybe their short-term profitability or, and maybe even their long-term, because they have put, put it all on the line to bring an idea into existence. And like farmers, these, these uh, smaller food companies, uh, are are faced everywhere they turn with somebody with a handout. Um, there's so many middlemen taking pieces of of their tiny pie. So uh, over over time, the idea of and as I said, as I started to see signs of interest in this this thing that was now called regenerative agriculture, but really this market for how you farm and not just what you farm. Um, I thought you know these two sides would be a perfect match because they share a similar mindset, a similar culture, a passion, a personal, they take it personal. It is personal to them. It's their, it's their whole livelihood. It's their family. It's everything. It's all embedded in what they do. And, um, and I know many of these small food companies are passionate about the quality of the product that they make and would love to know the farmer behind it if they could. Um, and so, so those, that's, you know, where a lot of it all came together. Yeah, you do a, a great job connecting those two parties. Can definitely see your your background in speech and debate, kind of seeing both sides of the spectrum and being able to communicate and connect those two parties is really cool. But Sarah, before we kind of dive into it, I'd love to just kind of level set for our audience and just define what regenerative agriculture is and what that entails. Regenerative ag- agriculture is a way of farming. It's a whole systems approach that aims to restore the natural resources rather than just maintaining them. And so, uh, you know, sustainability maybe refers to being able to continue, right? Um, but regenerative refers to taking this natural resource and making it even better than, than you found it and trying to get it closer to where maybe it was originally. And so particularly with the soil, I, I work with a lot of farmers who, um, you know, uh, farm out on the prairie and talk about the, the time when this the soil carbon was was so high, uh, but you know lost a lot of it after being worked for you know a number of years generations, and but now through the practices that they are imp- applying, they are actually seeing that soil carbon come back come back up um, from one percent to three percent in one farm's case. Uh, so that is an example of regenerative. You're not just able to keep going um, with the aid of more uh, inputs, uh, let's say but you're really taking the natural resource itself, primarily the soil, uh, to a better state than it was. Yeah, thanks for that uh, that description. I think that's really helpful, um, helpful for me to understand as well. Um, so Sarah, maybe talk us through, you kind of sh- started sharing, um, you know, you're working with these different, the, the farmers, these food companies. Talk a little bit more about the idea of grounded growth and the business model that you plan to go to market with. 
Yeah. So I, I was exploring, uh, the concept, uh, initially as a consulting pathway at the company, you know, I, I was already at, um, but I really started to see it as its own thing. And, and as, uh, the need and the, the ability that, that, that I could bring to it to, to make those introductions, to bring both sides together, because I understood both of them. Um, and to, to have that be my full focus, that, that became, uh, something I, I wanted to do, but of course I wanted to make sure that there was, uh, <laughs> that, that, was, that that was something else other people wanted to, uh, important when you launch a business. So, um, I did some exploratory meetings with, um, with farmers and food companies, um, and just had great interactions and great, uh, outcomes and great interests and saw the spark of what we are now in the full fledged midst of building, uh, right there and saw the interest in it, the value that both sides had of it. And, uh, and, and that was great. And then also I went to uh, the regenerative earth summit, um, in 20, I think late 2017 was the first one. Um, and saw, you know, <laughs> hard to describe this, but saw some of the, some of the sentiments that, uh, I had certainly been pushing for, uh, others in the kind of centrist place had been pushing for with soil carbon and a carbon market. But frankly, we had been, as I said, it had been attacked by, by both sides, by uh, the conservatives and the liberals who, for different reasons, uh, but both felt it wasn't a good policy. But now I was seeing at that summit uh, people who politically would have been much more to the left and much opposed to this, were opposed to this, uh, organizations that you know had been opposed to this. Now, I think because uh, climate change has gone on for you know again 20 more years and and not uh, a set policy, had come to see that it wasn't enough to just focus on uh, reducing emissions. That actually drawing down emissions, drawing it out of the atmosphere and into the soil, uh, which is what no-till and soil carbon sequestration does. Farming in a no-till way not only stores the carbon, but keeps it there. Um, and so there was this new appreciation of it, um, from, from a part of the spectrum and the natural food space that I hadn't seen it, um, uh, before. So that was very heartening and was also a big, uh, fact. I mean, I had already, I had just launched the company, but it really convinced me to, to fully focus on the regenerative piece and to really go forward because there was a lot of interest. Um, now, I, I will say, I think regenerative agriculture, there's some confusion around it as to whether it has to be attached to organic or whether it doesn't. And much of what you, much of what's out there about regenerative uh, is this regenerative organic certification pathway that they believe you have to build regenerative on top of organic. It's another layer. And uh, I don't <laughs> at all. Um, and again, back to my background of seeing the practices that actually store carbon that actually do have a climate uh, impact. Uh, but then also, as we've learned more about gut health and the disruption of our own um, digestive system, when we do things like take antibiotics and we kill off indiscriminately the good and the bad bacteria, we've seen you know really bad outcomes from that that we didn't understand before. And a similar thing is true in terms of tillage. Um, you know, we till up the, the land to control weeds, which you need to do uh, with an organic system. Um, that's almost like the physical uh, use. It's a, it's a physical version of antibiotics <laughs> because you're churning up the homes of these, of the soil microbiome. And it just, you know, it can't be good. Um, some of the farmers I work with talk about it as, as if you're sending a tornado through, um, through these little soil microbiome towns every year or maybe twice a year. Um, so it's just a physical disruption of that um, and the impact that that has on potentially the nutritional value of the food, as well as obviously the climate benefit are things that just haven't really been focused on certainly by consumers and, and even in the, in kind of the food space. So that's starting to be talked about more. Again, I think the climate issues pushed a lot of people to, to see that, but I know it's a little, little, windy off topic maybe, but, 
but these things were important in my decision to really go for because I had such a deep background in understanding what I call the no-till plus pathway could provide. And um, if you look at the people who really are the pioneers around regenerative agriculture, in, in, in my book at least, it, are, it is these no-till farmers who experimented, who came up with ways to plant green. I mean, I had, uh, that's an amazing thing. If you've never seen that, just type in planting green into, or just go to one of our regenerative minutes. We do a whole series called the regenerative minute. And we have one on planting green and you see a farmer actually planting a new crop into live rye. It's like up to the, <laughs> up to almost the window of the tractor. And it's an amazing thing. And he did that by making his own equipment and experimenting and trying. And it's just, it's what the best farmers have always done. Experiment, make, make something work, tailor it, tinker with it, you know, keep, keep going until you get the result that you, that you want. And in this case, the result is not only good for their operation because it helps them to be profitable, focusing on a per acre profitability rather than just yield um, because they can reduce their inputs over time by, by farming in this way. But it also is great for the environment, and we believe uh, great for um, the nutritional value of the crops they're raising, too. And that's an area where we're partnering with uh, people that are doing nutrient density testing so that the farmers in our network can start to get a baseline and we can start to compare that. That's really cool. A lot of a lot of stuff to take away from that. But I kind of wanted to dig into kind of the early days of building the community. Like, did how did you get the word out um, using your marketing background to kind of get a network of growers and interested companies kind of connecting those dots? Yeah. Um, so earlier this year, I mean, we I spent a lot of time building the actual platform because as I mean, I have a team of, of, of people and they're great, but they all have their own businesses too. <laughs> so I get, you know, small amounts of their time and, um, and it's pretty much me, you know, running, running things. So I had to, as, as entrepreneurs do, I had to learn about, <laughs> about building a site and working with, you know, some help to do that and spent a lot of time pulling the features together from three different pieces of software so that it all would work well. And that what we have now is essentially like a private, a combination of a private Facebook and Netflix. So we can have our, it's not nearly as entertaining, but we have video content that we do uh, ourselves that is for our members only, but they can come in and watch it at any time. And it's about whether it's from practices about regenerative farming that farmers are sharing with each other or interviews with our food company partners so that they can understand what food companies want. We have a whole case study in depth um, interviews of that. Uh, and we will add more of that as we go. We'll keep interviewing experts that are valuable to the community. So it's this resource that'll be there for our members whenever they want to check in and do that learning or for brands who want to learn about how a farmer actually does this and what maybe their farmer, even if they work with that farmer uh, is like. Um, and so it was a lot of building. And then at the beginning of this year, we really opened the doors and we're ready to add members. And so I went to the No-Till on the Plains conference with uh, my, my farm uh, farmer partner in the business, Justin Knopf, who could not do that. I mean, couldn't do this with without a lot of people, but especially Justin is just right at the core. Um, he's been a farmer for almost 20 years. I've known him for 10. Um, he actually lives in a town that's like, where my parents retired to in Kansas. So, I mean, it's just crazy. The stars have aligned to, to how that, have that happen. But anyway, I went to that conference with Justin and he knows a lot of folks in the no-till community, uh, obviously. And so we were talking, um, to them and going to the sessions and listening to farmers present and, um, sharing our story. And we were lucky enough to be able to have our case study talked about at, uh, at their AIM conference, which is the day after, um, the main, the main session, focusing on agricultural innovation. And um, so our brand, Bella Gluten Free and Justin um, were there and, and Bella Gluten Free's owner, Cecilia Chiarlo, shared the story of working with Justin and Grounded Growth and why why she was doing that. And of course, that got a lot of farmers' attention because, hey, here's a small food company that actually wants to work with farmers, um, is passionate about about them and what they're doing, and it, and they didn't have to be organic. Um, and in fact, some of the first conversations that that 
our food companies had with the farmers were is exactly that. They would ask, you know, well, could you go organic? And and our farmers would say, well, you actually can't can't pay me enough to go organic because that would damage my soil too much. I care too much about the soil health to go organic, which just floored them because they, you know, <laughs> it just went outside the realm of what was possible, you know, because to them, organic is just the highest standard of all things. And I don't, don't blame them for that. That's, that's just what a lot of people think. So, um, seeing that realization that there was a, a brand that was willing, that, that was willing to kind of see the value of what no-till, this no-till plus regenerative pathway was, um, opened a lot of doors for us. And, and, uh, frankly, the other thing that really helped us get a foothold with a number of amazing farmers, uh, was the fact that regenerative agriculture is very buzzy, if you will. I mean, it's being talked about in a lot of places. A lot of big food companies have set goals to expand their, um, you know, their, their market share. But, um, when the farmers would explore those options, there weren't clear value adding, well, at least not value enough adding uh, pathways for the farmers. So there's a lot of focus on education, and uh, but not a desire to pay more for this higher value performance, particularly if you're talking about handing over data. And that's something that we are fighting for. We're trying to build uh, a, a pathway that is win-win for everybody in that the smaller brands won't have to pay as much if, as if they were to source organic, but they would pay more than if they were just buying conventional because they're not only getting the crop, they're getting the data, the story, the marketing value, and it, like a brand ambassador built in, in, in the farmer that comes to, to be their partner. So uh, our pathway is, is this value adding, and we can't guarantee that that will succeed. I mean, it's, you know, the farmers that are working with us are betting on me, you know, and I'm, and I'm betting on them. So it, that feels good. But we're one of the few, I think, organizations that that's trying to do that for farmers, particularly farmers who've done this kind of no-till plus regenerative farming for 20 years and have amazing data. Um, and so when we were able to get a number of those kind of farmers to join us, uh, their reputation alone drew other farmers. <laughs> As you know, farmers talk to each other, and uh, and we're very grateful for that. So that's kind of the base that we that we have. I wanted to start with with a farm base, and to get the farmers in the community integrated, talking, learning about what the natural food company sector needs. So that as I start to bring brands in, uh, which we're starting to do now, there's this lively farm community just waiting for them, and then I can easily introduce the right farmer to to each of these brands, depending on what they grow and where they're at and all those things. Cause we, I already know that we've already started that phase of it. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. I, I think, you know, what you mentioned about how you're kind of going out to these conferences, connecting with farmers, farmers talking to each other, it sounds like you really cultivated a, a great community. So Sarah, as we, as we wrap up this section, I'd be curious a little bit more detail of, and you mentioned a case study, but uh, you can use that one or another one of kind of an example of how a farmer who maybe was previously farming conventionally um, wants to change their practice practices and you mentioned the no-till plus um, so maybe you can get into that a little more detail but how you work with a farmer like that to start implementing these practices and then how the kind of transaction or the partnership works with a food company yeah so we have three pathways really um, and the first is if a farmer like you mentioned would join and is like full conventional but wants to get into regenerative well, the pathway for that farmer is going to be a lot of learning from, frankly, the other farmers in the group. Um, and then they're going to be able to learn about the kinds of things that we recommend, like the nutrient density testing, the soil carbon testing. Uh, within our network now, we have soil health uh, testing and testing and advising companies. We have a mill. We have, you know, we have all the resources needed to take this all the way to market. And we are working on projects now to do that. Um, including talking with natural food companies and as, as potential buyers of you know, something like a regenerative flour that could be made by you know, the members of our network or the growers and the mill, you know, is the mill. And uh, so for that farmer, there's a lot of learning that they're going to need to do before 
I could say that there's likely to be a premium, but they could get uh, what is our second path. So that, that first pathway is just being able to have all the pieces in place and access to these great, all this great information to start to make that change. Um, as I said, the on-demand kind of resources. The second pathway, which they could also, even a new farmer uh, could, could take advantage of too, is a sponsorship. And so we, that, and that is what our case study was. It's a brand sponsorship. And that was designed because even though everybody would love to get to direct sourcing like tomorrow, I get that, it's very hard to do. <laughs> there's a lot of logistical challenges in the way. I mean, there's a reason why the supply chain is as it is now um, for, for efficiency. But um, so, in, in, you know, instead of just saying, well, we're going to wait until everything's perfect, very much our motto is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Going back to learning uh, on Capitol Hill, uh, seeing very good ideas killed because many people thought they weren't perfect. So that has stuck with me. But so the sponsorship idea is, and it, again, it's what our case study was, two of our brands, Bella Gluten Free and Around the World Gourmet, uh, committed to provide 1% of their net sales for a year to a project that Justin Knopf, again, our, our core starter, first farmer, uh, did. And it was a five species cover crop that he, he implemented on uh, a 72 acre field. And he had never done that before he'd done cover crops, but he hadn't done five species and he hadn't done those species. He hadn't done that window and he hadn't done it, you know, just lots of things he hadn't done specifically. And, you know, this came about because we were talking to both of them and we had wanted to get Justin Sorghum into, into their brands. But again, with the challenges that came with that, we realized that, well, why not take a step back and just help a farmer learn and go further on his regenerative journey or her regenerative journey than, uh, than they are now. And we all know there are farmers that you have to draw the line somewhere because, you know, you could spend a lot of money on, cover crop seeds and, and all sorts of different great practices that don't pay you right now. And not only that costs you, uh, not only in the amount of seed money that you pay for the seed, but in potentially in moisture, potentially in, um, in yield, uh, short-term yield, in the long-term you might get it back. But so we wanted to have a project that we knew we could do and uh, that wouldn't disrupt everybody's supply chain. So Bella Gluten-Free and Around the World Gourmet do not take Justin's crop into their, into their um, products, but they are able to market the fact that they helped that farmer go further on his journey. And that's what we have done for them, creating videos and Instagram and Facebook posts and telling that story and helping giving that to their, to, to use in their media. And so any farmer that would join our network, if we could find a brand to sponsor them could, could do that option. And then the third option is, of course, where, again, everybody wants to get to, uh, which is the direct sourcing piece. But we also learned and, and believe in the value of the stair-step approach. So the sponsorship gives the chance for the brand and the farm to get to know each other, to work together, to the, the, in exchange for the, the sponsorship, the farmer serves as a brand ambassador for the brand. So they stand out in the field and take a picture with the product and, and agree to have that, you know, me on, on the brand, social media and marketing. So there's a great way to start a relationship there. And, um, once you have a relationship, it's funny how all sorts of barriers start to fall down and things that didn't make sense before are worth considering because you're now trying to do something together long-term. And that's one of the hardest things I feel like I'm trying to push against is this transactional way that business is done particularly in, in commodities and in ag and, and frankly, in the food business. And again, I understand why it's that way. I'm not trying to fault it, but there's a lot that can't get, uh, can't be brought through to the consumer that the consumer wants now, because we have a different set of consumers. Um, and you can't bring data about how something was made and you can't be authentic if you don't know who your farmer is. You, I mean, just so many things that you really can't do well uh, with the supply chain we have, because it wasn't designed to do those things. It was designed to just create cheap, safe, uh, non-unique food. <laughs> and that, that's what it's done. So, um, we're creating, we're kind of going back, you know, back to the past where you knew the person that made the input that you used to, to turn into your product. And you both had a stake in each other's business. And, um, 
and took that responsibility seriously. And then, you know, over time you both win and it may one year, one of you may do a little better the other year, the other, but you're in a long-term committed relationship. Um, and that's again, what's possible with these smaller brands and larger farms because, uh, the, the model just fits better. Yeah, that makes makes a lot of sense. It's good to see those those case case studies, and you're bringing a lot of value to the growers and uh, and the food companies in your network. So that's really cool. So as we finish things up for this section, Sarah, what's your vision for grounded growth in the next twelve months? Yes, um, well, I I would love to see us really really push through this this regenerative flower project. I don't know, frankly, if we'll be able to. But uh, we have all the pieces to do it, and I'm excited that we're going to get that chance to try. Um, I really look forward to more brands coming on and, and starting to to see the community that we have. I mean, I, I I struggle to to really just get the message out enough, and so I'm so grateful for you all to to have me on the podcast. That's a that's a wonderful help for <laughs> for any small business. Um, because I, again, I know that what we have, the kind of farmers that we have, the culture that we have, it, it fits just perfectly with what many of them want, but they're bombarded day after day with people telling them the same thing. <laughs> it's, it's in my opinion, not nearly as true, but I have to get that chance to uh, earn their trust and to give them a, a window into what we're doing. And so uh, that just takes time and just takes continuing outreach, the outreach and continuing to put uh, the great farmers that we have out in front of, in front of them. But I think, uh, I've, I've had to learn a lot of the pieces that now I'm excited to just run with. So for example, like I had to learn video editing. I had to, I had to learn how to put our, our, our regenerative minute series together, but I've learned that now and it's, and it's done great for us in terms of getting, uh, message out the message out about regenerative agriculture, what it is, and it features our farmers doing doing practices. So, you know, we were able to say each time, you know, this could be your farmer and this story could be your, in your brand. You, you could tell this story to your consumers. So I think uh, as the as the there's a lot of again, a lot of hype, a lot of uh, marketing and buzz about regenerative agriculture. And so some of that has to settle a bit. But I've already seen indications that there's a hunger for something practical, something tangible something grounded. And that's exactly where we are. So I'm hoping that we'll meet that moment over the, over the next year, really expand our membership and have a couple of good sourcing stories to be able to tell you next year. Yeah, it sounds like you're on the right track. And I, I like what you said about building that f- foundation uh, for the business. And I think that a lot of people can relate to that. Um, building, Starting a company, building a business is not something e- that's easy to do. And the fact that you've kind of uh, laid that foundation with um, from media and building this online community and networking, I think is really, really awesome. And I think it's going to be exciting to see how you guys grow over the next uh, next year. And we'll definitely have to have you back on to talk through some, some more or, uh, sourcing stories. Um, but Sarah, as we move to um, our next segment, which we call Quick Takes, what business book has most positively impacted you and what was the major takeaway? You know, I thought about that. Um, and I would say more than any book, it's Tony Robbins. <laughs> it's just Tony Robbins. Um, I don't know if you've seen his Netflix special, I'm Not Your Guru, which of course he is. He is everybody's guru. Um, but uh, of course, I've read a lot of business books and self-help books and, and get a lot of value from those. But there's just something about um, his energy and his sincere desire to help people and, and his ability to do it um, that really connects to me. Um, and I, I aspire to be a bridge builder and to, to connect people. And so maybe that's why he, he's so powerful. But I haven't, I'm not successful enough to have gone to one of his in, live <laughs> performances yet, but you know, someday that's on my list. That's a good bucket list item for sure. I'll have to check out that Netflix special. What are you spending too much money on right now? The good news is I'm not spending a lot of money on anything right now. <laughs> I, I've, uh, I feel like I've made mistakes early on that I'm sure a lot of, a lot of companies do. I, I have spent, I guess, a good amount of money having to learn uh, 
marketing and uh, how to perfect that. And, and I don't think that, that that's a bad expense, but um, it's just frustrating as I learn more about it, how hard it is to kind of cut through the noise. I mean, we're in a time when it's so easy. It's just so easy to get your message out there. And yet it's so hard to find an audience and to build an audience. Uh, and it's not because it's not there. I mean, every, I've read all the consumer research I've read, you know, uh, just it, it I, I know it's there, but it's, uh, there's just so much competing for people's attention. I definitely agree. I mean, I think you're spot on where um, it's easier than ever to connect with people, but it's also harder than ever because there's so much noise. So I think your money's well spent uh, focusing on marketing efforts. So um, on the on the flip side, what are you not spending enough money on? Probably going to conferences. I mean, I've cut back on those, um, both because I've been really in this phase of building, um, building the business, bringing on people. I'm 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 finishing up um, some courses for our community that try to really take them by the hand and step by step say, this is what the other side is thinking. This is what they want. This is what this is how you how you get yourself in shape to be there. And these are your options. So much more in depth from kind of, kind of what we've talked about. And that's, and then also I spend a lot of time talking to brands and I'm always trying to find the right place to meet them. I know some of these conferences are, are that opportunity, but it's also, they're so distracted. There's so much competition for their time. And, you know, so I've really um, cut way back on that and, but maybe too far. (laughs) If you could personally invest in any agricultural company, who would it be and why? It would probably be Pipeline Foods, both because I know their founder very well and think very highly of Eric Jackson. Um, And I just, I love what they're trying to do, what what they are doing. They're really connecting the supply chain, you know, all the way through. I think they're focusing a lot on organic, uh, but also non-GMO. They are building that well, that pipeline, you know, that really kind of pulls it all together. And I, I feel like we're creating a community that, of course, would be great to push through that pipeline. So. <laughs> what app can you not live without? Probably HubSpot, I have to say. I mean, that that helps me manage my business in just an amazing way. I should really get money from them. But um, <laughs> nice, 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 nice plug there. <laughs> nice plug there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, HubSpot, Trello, you know, they really just help you organize and manage your business and track it so much easier. I was I was just telling my husband the other day, it's amazing. Oh, Calendly too, where you can just send your link and have say, here's my calendar, schedule yourself. That one, uh, top, probably top of the list because you waste so much time going back and forth. About, well, can you do Wednesday at three or no? How about Thursday at five? It, you know, it just, ugh. so um to get, get rid of that has been wonderful. Yeah, those are some good ones. Well, Sarah, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, talking with you here today. Um, can you tell us about any interests you have outside of Grounded Growth? <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so I have a, a daughter who's nine, and uh, she fills our days with all sorts of joy and uh, exploration. Um, and uh, a husband who I love dearly and, and two dogs. we huge fans of Labrador Retrievers. So we take a walk in the woods nearby our house every day, and that helps me stay grounded. So uh, that and cooking. I love cooking and having people over for dinner. Um, so um, those are some of my favorite things. That's awesome. Well, Sarah, thanks so much for the time. As we finish up, how can listeners get in touch and connect with you and Grounded Growth? Yeah, so our website is ourgroundedgrowth.com. It's O-U-R, groundedgrowth.com. And my email is Sarah at just S A R A at ourgroundedgrowth.com. And uh, we have a little, you know, thing on our website that says, How can I help you? It comes right to me. So if um, if anybody has a question, you know, I'd love to to talk talk with them that way. Oh, I should add that of course we we have a pretty active Instagram and Facebook page and uh, a link my LinkedIn account, um, Sarah Harper. So those are also good things. Awesome. Thanks again for being with us, Sarah. We really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. So Ty, what'd you think? 
Oh man, Sarah's just such a wealth of knowledge. Uh, it was so fun talking to her. I think the whole concept of how are we, you know, offering premiums and more value to the farmers is just so important in agriculture. We, you know, people talk about it a lot about how do we, um, how do fa- how do farmers get the value of their work? And I think she's just doing it, approaching it from a really cool perspective. Yeah, I agree. I like the the way that she looks at the business and kind of sorting out the companies that are looking at regenerative just as a marketing ploy where she actually wants to to connect both parties and make it a true win-win not just a not just an advertisement totally and i I think she's actually done it uh she's been successful doing it and creating these partnerships so would definitely encourage any any farmers out there any food companies uh to to check out uh, ourgroundedgrowth.com, see what they're doing check out uh, what their community offers um would encourage you to do that Yeah, guys, we appreciate you listening this week, and we look forward to talking to you soon. 